Hello, and welcome again to Reading Together, as we are reading together Heaven Taken by Storm, uh, with its very puritanical subtitle, Showing the Holy Violence a Christian is to Put Forth in the Pursuit After Glory by the Puritan Thomas Watson. So as I have been noting, we have been um, reading through this book, and so far, Watson has spent the majority of, uh, of this time, this, this, this fairly significant section of the book, talking about how we are to offer violence to ourselves um, as, we, as we are making our way in our, in our, in our earthly pilgrimage toward uh, the New Jerusalem, toward, as Bunyan would call it, the celestial city towards heaven. Right, And so he's primarily been discussing what we would now call today the spiritual disciplines or the means of grace, right? And so we'll get to some to some other things that he tells us uh, next week as he tells us as he te- shows us how we are to offer violence against the world and against Satan. But for this week, we will finish up these uh, the ways that we offer violence to our selves um, by these by these spiritual disciplines. And so we'll be discussing chapters eight. In chapters 9. Um, and so first of all, chapter 8, um, uh, Watson is describing to us how we are to offer violence by sanctifying the Lord's day or making the Lord's day holy. And so this chapter um, can, can roughly be divided into about three parts. So first of all, he begins by explaining the Lord's day, um, and why, why the Lord's day is important, um, why we uh, why we have we have why we have a great reason to sanctify the Lord's day, and then he gives us a list of reasons why we must uh, how we must sanctify the Lord's day. We must rest from all our from all the works of our calling. We must lift up our hearts in thankfulness to God. We must prepare ourselves for the sanctification of the Lord's day. We must labor to be bettered by each one. We must dedicate the whole day to God. Um, God doubles His blessing to us on this day, and we must rejoice in the Lord's day. And then he concludes this chapter with a word to the magistrates on, uh, or the civil authorities on, on maintaining the, the holiness of the Lord's day. And so that's the overall, the overall, um, scope of the chapter. And so, um, let me go through and just point out some things that, uh, some, some comments that I have about this. So first of all, when he explains what the Lord's day is, um, is that first of all, he notes that, uh, and this is the beginning of the second paragraph, he says, our Christian Sabbath comes in the room of the Jewish Sabbath. It is called the Lord's Day, from Christ, the author of it, right? And so this is Watson explaining um, that the that the Christian Sabbath, what we call Lord's Day, on that we celebrate on Sunday, each each Sunday that we gather for worship, has replaced the Jewish Sabbath, which was on Saturday, right? Um, and so this is and this is one place where I would just slightly disagree with Watson. I don't know if he would have uh, necessarily saw this as a, as a slight disagreement, but I would take it as a, as a, as a slight disagreement that, um, that I would not go so far as to say that the Lord's day is, um, is a replacement, um, is, is, is a, or is, is a one-to-one replacement of the Jewish Sabbath, uh, I think is the best way to say that. Um, I do think that the Sabbath has been replaced by the Lord's Day, but I don't think it's a one-to-one replacement. I don't think that the Lord's Day is the Christian Sabbath and uh, that the fourth commandment um, applies in, in the same way uh, today with, 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 with our worship on Sunday as it did with the Jewish Sabbath. Um, so now, in saying that, I think that I think that what Watson presents here of how we should sanctify the Lord's day I think is 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 absolutely true. I think that we that we should if at all possible we should sanctify the Lord's day. Um but I would not go so far as but I would not go so far as to say um that it is uh that that I think that I think the the fulfillment of the fourth commandment uh, of keeping the Sabbath day holy um, has now been fulfilled in Christ, who is our Sabbath day rest. Um, and so I think that there is a, and so I think there is a, there's a pattern um, as Watson gives um, for us to observe the Lord's day. Uh, but I don't think that that is, but I don't think that that is completely that that's that that has just just that it has the same weight as the Jewish Sabbath um, or the same or the same necessity. Um, so, but I think. Like so many things, um, so me speaking as a Baptist, um, we we Baptists, um, I'll, I'll take shots on my own crowd. Um, we tend to 
um, we tend to, I, I believe, um, in response to what we see as 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 an extreme view, we tend to dive to the other extreme. So one of these, one one example is baptism, right? Um, so it seems that almost in response to um, to, to 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 the Church of Christ view of baptism, which we which we view as as, as wrong, that baptism uh, that baptism is is linked with salvation, and, and uh, salvation happens upon baptism. Um, then we tend to to go to the other to the other end, and uh, baptism and 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 sort of seem to almost downgrade baptism, or maybe maybe Lord's Supper is another good example of in response to in response to the more um, high church liturgical um, liturgical denominations. Um, their viewing of, of Lord's Supper and Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper. You know, we take the we take uh, Zwingli's um, his 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 me- memorial view of the Lord's Supper, um, and and sometimes that that our 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 quickness to acknowledge that there is that, that that there's that there's no special grace that's being conferred to us through the Lord's Supper can lead us to um, to, to 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 sometimes inadvertently devalue the Lord's Supper. Um, and so we need to, and so, and so we need to be cautious, um, that we don't do those things, that baptism and Lord's Supper, um, while I don't believe that there's, that there's a, a, a sort of, you know, mystical imparting of grace through those, uh, through those, through those actions, um, that I do believe that, that baptism and Lord's Supper as, as ceremonies, as, as ordinances that Christ has called us to, to observe, they are important. And the same thing with the Lord's Day. Um, that just because I don't believe that it has one to one replaced the Jewish Sabbath, um, I do think that it is still uh, that, that that we do still do a disservice to it. Um, oftentimes today, of of not remembering it. Um, and so one of the one of the points that I love most about Thomas Watson uh, of of this chapter is um, in the third paragraph. Where he where he begins with the with uh, by by introducing that paragraph by saying what great cause do we have to thankfully remember this day? Then he goes on to talk about how the the Israel's return from the Babylonian captivity drowned out the remembrance of their deliverance from Egypt, right? Which was to that point was their their greatest moment of salvation, where God brought them out of out of their slavery in Egypt, right? But the but him bringing them up out of the Babylon Babylonian captivity. Um, was 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 almost a greater uh, work of redemption than even that. And Watson goes on to say um, that that our redemption in Christ, right, is the greater Exodus, and it's the greater um, it's the greater leaving of captivity of Christ setting the captives free, right. Um, and he has this great line. He says, "Great was the work of creation, right, which was." Which is where the Sabbath day principle is is rooted in, right? Um, that God worked for six days and then He rested on the seventh, right? But great was the work of creation, but greater the work of redemption. It cost more to redeem us than to make us. Mm. And so, if there is a reason why we should celebrate Sunday as Resurrection Day, right? And Resurrection Day doesn't just come once a year on the uh, on on the the celebration that, that we typically call Easter, right? Resurrection Sunday is every single Sunday. There's a reason why you worship weekly. That is our celebration, is because even more than the work of creation that the Jews celebrate with their, with Sabbath day, we celebrate by gathering together, by singing together, by listening to the word together, by being in fellowship with one another. We celebrate the greater work of redemption, the new creation that has been given to us. And so he goes on and he says, In creation God gave us ourselves. In redemption he gives us himself. Thus the Sabbath, putting us in the mind of our redemption, ought to be observed with the highest devotion, right? And so he goes on and he talks about some ways that we can sanctify the Lord Day, right? So first we must rest from all our all the works of our calling, right? To, to, to treat this as a different day, um, to set aside all the things that we do. And, and he gives a, a powerful point of that Mary Magdalene um, even refused to anoint 
Christ's dead body on the Sabbath day, right? But she prepared the anointment and she did not come to Jesus's grave until the Sabbath day was passed, right? Um, and then he says on, on what, are, what are some things that we're supposed to do on the Sabbath instead? Um, but instead we must prepare, uh, we must lift up our hearts um, to God in thankfulness on the Sabbath. And so he says, uh, he ends that paragraph by saying, Christian, lift up your heart to God in thankfulness that he has given you another golden season. Be sure you improve it. It may be the last. Seasons of grace are not like the tide. If a man misses one tide, he may have another, right? (laughs) And so, and so God has given us, uh, so on, 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 on the Lord's Day, we have a chance to remember everything that the Lord has given us. It's a it's a holiday, a day a day of holiness where we get to where we get to um, mark that another week has passed, or or that another week is is beginning, right? Um, and so then we get to um, remind ourselves that, that that God has given us grace that he that He does not promise to come in the future, right? And maybe one of the most important points that He makes in this chapter is He says we must prepare ourselves. The next paragraph following after that. He says, this day approaching, we must in the morning dress and fit our souls for the receiving of the word, right? So in other words, we must prepare ourselves. Well, how are we supposed to do that? He says, our hearts must be washed by prayer and repentance before the oracles of God are to be delivered to us. And being met together, we must set ourselves as in the presence of God with seriousness and delight to hear his sacred word. Take heed of distractions which blow away our duties, and I love that. That that, and again, that is so much. Uh, that 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 second and the last sentence is so much. Uh, what I love about the Puritans is um, we must set ourselves in the presence of God with seriousness and delight, um, and that's what that's what I want um, for, for my walk with the Lord. Uh, is that I don't want I don't want a a delight um, that is that is frivolous, and I don't want a seriousness that is joyless. But instead, um, I want. But instead, I want to follow the Lord with both seriousness and delight, with a sober joy, right? And I think that the Puritans are are a wonderful place to find that. Um, and so we must prepare our hearts, prepare ourselves um, for for uh, being in the presence of God. Um, in the pre- and in the presence of our fellow brothers and sisters who are temples of the Holy Spirit with us. And so, um, and then he, he goes on and tells us that we must labor to be bettered by each Sabbath day, that we must dedicate the whole day to God. Um, he tells us that, we, that, that, God will, uh, that, that God gives double blessings on the Sabbath day. Um, and he tells us that we must rejoice in seeing it, right? Um, and he says that we should, uh, and I loved, loved this. He says, we should look upon this day as a spiritual market for our souls, wherein we have a holy commerce and traffic with God. This day of rest is the beginning of an eternal rest, right? So it's a, it's a, so the, our, our resting on the, on the Lord's day is a chance to remember that we have that eternal rest in Christ, right? And then finally he ends. He ends with a, uh, a very interesting <laughs> point, uh, kind of like what we said in the first in the first chapter, where he gave a warning, where he gave a word to the magistrates, to the civil authorities, um, that they should um, take it upon themselves to enforce godliness, right? In the same way, um, he 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 says in the final paragraph of this chapter that magistrates should take it upon themselves um, to cause the Lord's day to be observed. That is to to, to wield the sword of their governmental authority to make sure that people are keeping the Lord's day holy, right? Um, and then he has this word directly to, uh, to, to one of the civil magistrates. He says, my Lord, your proclamation for the pious observation of the Sabbath and your punitive, that is punishing, <laughs> acts upon some offenders have given a public testimony of your zeal for this day. The keeping of the honor of the Sabbath will much increase your magisterial honor. So, <laughs> probably um, not a not a ton of people today would agree with Watson on that point uh, that that people not observing the Lord's Supper 
uh, not observing the Lord's day, sorry, um, deserve punitive acts, deserve to be, uh, deserve to be punished with the law. And so, but that is certainly what um, Watson saw that as a, as a very good thing um, to see the, the zeal of the magistrates um, in, in, in making sure that the Lord's day was being kept, right? And so um, I think, I think it, as I said, this is a, this is a, a very important point. And I think that um, one of the things that we should remember as the, um, um, especially since, the, uh, since we talked about that the Lord's day um, has replaced the Sabbath day, just I, just I believe not in a one-to-one, uh, not, in, not in an exact fashion. Um, but one of the significance, significances with us worshiping now on Sunday, I think, relates to um, the very nature of the gospel. Um, so whereas, whereas with Saturday being the, being the Jewish Sabbath, there were six days of work and then a day of rest. Um, this, uh, the fact that we worship and rest on the first day of the week, the Lord's day, and then we work another six days of the week. Um, that is, that is a reflection of the gospel. Right, so it's like the so it's like the, uh, the the gospel has not only brought us out of uh, the old covenant and into the new covenant, but it has reshaped how we structure our weeks so that our week is reflexive of that. Right, so no longer do we work in order to rest, but instead now we rest in order to work. And so I would encourage you um, to to it's I think in 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 the modern day it's become uh, very easy for us to 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 view Monday as the beginning of the week. Um, and I've been really struggling to try to um, correct my thinking into viewing Sunday as the start of the week. Um, so that way, I, so that way, I remember that the week begins with rest, not with work. Right? Work comes out of the rest, but but God gives me rest that first day of the week um, without anything, without me doing having done anything in order to deserve or to earn that. And so I would encourage you to keep. That chapter nine, he discusses um, holy conversation, right? So this is how we are to um, to have conversation or discourse with one another, the conversations that we are supposed to have together as Christians. And I love that this is uh, this is one of the the duties that he puts there, right? Because I think that um, that, you know we think of we think of uh, fellowship, but I don't know if we've ever if if it's very often that we actually think of it in terms of of us, of us, you know, having conversations with one another and considering those a, a form of spiritual discipline, this, uh, or as Watson is saying, a form of holy violence that we keep, right? And so this chapter is pretty easy to break down. So first of all, he gives just a importance of having this holy conversation, of talking about holy things, and then he gives some considerations for us to have. He tells us that discourse demonstrates what the heart is, that holy conversation is very edifying, that gracious discourse makes us resemble Christ, that God takes special notice of every good word that we speak when we meet, and then finally, holy discourse will be a means to bring Christ into our company. And so I love when he's uh, in, the, in, the, in the first page of this chapter um, where he is explaining uh, the, the, the importance of holy conversation he says, a gracious person does not have religion only in his heart, but also in his tongue, right? Um, and so this is a, it's a perfect way to set this up, is that, um, is that, the, is that our, our confession of faith, right? Um, it is, uh, yes, we must indeed believe that Christ is the Son of God, and that, and that begins um, in, in our own hearts. But the Christian faith also, also begins with, a confession of proclaiming Christ as Lord, and so and so we must not simply believe in Christ with our hearts, but we confess Him with our mouths. Right? Christianity is a is a religion that proclaims truth. Right? We cling to Jesus as our Lord, and so it is true that a person must not have religion only in our hearts, but we must also have it with our tongue. Um, and probably one of the most um, convicting. <laughs> <laughs> um, passages that, that 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 Watson puts in here is just a little bit down, where he says that it is the fault of Christians that they do not, in company, provoke themselves to good discourse. And he says it is a sinful modesty. There is much visiting, but they do not give one another's souls a visit. 
And then he goes on and he says, In worldly things their tongue is as the pen of a ready writer, but in matters of religion it is as if their tongue did cleave to the roof of their mouth. We must answer to God for idle words, so also for sinful silence. Man. So I think that I would imagine that that is, uh, that that is a little bit too close um, for comfort uh, for so many uh, for so many of us modern churches today, just as um, I, I suppose that it was for Watson's day because he's writing it. There is much visiting, but they do not give one another's souls a visit, right? And then he has this, he goes on and he has this wonderful illustration where he talks about the world as being a great inn, a great inn and we are guests in the inn, right? And there's travelers that we meet there in the inn um, and, and they, uh, that do not, but we do not spend all their time in speaking about the inn, right? So this is um, comparing the world to the inn and, and we shouldn't, and, and just as travelers when they're staying in a hotel, they don't spend all their time talking about the hotel. They talk about the world outside. In the same way, we should talk about our heavenly home, our heavenly country. This world is a, we're on pilgrimage in this world, right? Um, we shouldn't spend all of our conversations talking about the things of this world because we are not meant for this world. We are not long for this world. And so that's a wonderful analogy, right? Travelers in hotels don't spend all their time talking about the hotel that they're presently staying in, right? And so he goes on and he talks about some of these um, these considerations for us to, to have when it comes to um, having holy conversation. And so the first thing that he says is that discourse demonstrates what the heart is. And this is another hard-hitting hard hitting one, right? Um, that he says, vain speech discovers a light, feathery heart. Gracious speeches are the birth of a gracious heart, right? So whatever comes out of our mouth <laughs> is showing where our heart is. And so, um, and so, uh, mm. so do your words, <laughs> do your words. Um, and the conversations that you have with others, do they show um, that your heart is set on heaven, right? Do you have a a heavenly conversation in the way that you speak. The apostle bids us um, to to edify one another um, is what Watson says in this next point. And he says, how more than in this way? He says, good conversations enlightens the mind when it is ignorant and settles it when it is wavering. And he goes on and he says, a good life adorns religion. Good discourse propagates it, (laughs) which is so true. A good life is the is the adornment of the religion, but it is good discourse that actually that actually sends it further into other people, right? And then um, probably the most I think the most powerful point that he makes in this chapter is he says that gracious discourse makes us resemble Christ because who was more gracious in his words than Christ, right? Even his even his calling out of the Pharisees was was a was a um, um, was a was a was a showing them of their error. Was a was a uh, begging them just as he as he as he wept over Jerusalem, right? Of of, of longing for people to come into repentance, right? And so he uh, says at the end of that at the end of that paragraph, the more holy our speeches are, the more we are like Christ, right? And that draws us to the the end of the chapter where he says that um where he says that holy discourse will. It will be a means to bring Christ into our company. And then he, he closes out that paragraph and this chapter by saying, When men entertain bad discourse, Satan draws near and makes as though he were one of their company. But when they have a holy and gracious conversation, Jesus Christ draws near, and wherever he comes, he brings a blessing along with him. And this is far truer than we realize, right? There is only There are only two paths in this world, right? And so we only... Um, and so we only, uh, by our gracious and holy uh, conversations and conduct and speech, uh, do we do we um, bring Christ's presence, as it were, into our conversation, or we bring the presence of our enemy into our conversation, right? Um, and so may we conduct ourselves um, like Christ in our speech. May our speech be edifying to one another, and may our speech be um, be be a, be a demonstration of where our heart is. May our hearts be set upon the kingdom of God and upon glory, and may our speech likewise flow. 
And so I pray uh, that these two chapters, I pray that this whole section that Watson has been talking about how we are to do violence against ourselves, I pray that that has been beneficial to you. And next week we will begin, um, we will see as Watson tells us um, how we are to, instructs us on how we are to offer violence to the world and to Satan. And so I'll see you then. Grace and peace.